Welcome back, spooky cuties, or welcome to my hilariously low budget channel. Tis I, of course, your ghost host with the most Patricia Absinthe here to bring you more ghost stories or book ghost stories. When I saw this, it gave me just so much nostalgia over the Scholastic Book Fair. Uh, haunted Canada books that would have like all the true ghost stories that were never that scary personally. When I saw this romantic ghost stories, huh, I was intrigued. I was hooked. I had to know. But let's review some of these together. Enjoy some ASMR asthma breathing <laughs> reading. Interesting. Okay. Do we want to do this in order? Maybe I'll read. I'll read these in order, and then if you guys end up liking them, I will read more. But we'll discuss however long they are. We'll see how we feel about them. If we like them, if my eyelash gets wonky, uh, nothing I can do about it. It keeps doing that today. <laughs> and let's just read some romantic ghost stories. See if we think they sound real, if they're even romantic. Because I've read through a couple of these before, and I think dead videos from like three years ago. I don't even know if I posted them. No idea. So I remember being unimpressed, but <laughs> only one way to find out, and let's find out together. And also, I have the memory of a potato sometimes, so I don't remember any of these except for going. It's not scary. <laughs> so let's see. So this is Romantic Ghost Stories by Julie Burtonshaw. We'll read a few. We'll see how we feel. If you enjoy this, I will, of course, happily make a series because what is more goth? Well, depending on who you ask, than a goth girl reading you romantic ghost stories. <laughs> I know it would be more goth to some of the snobs if I had Bauhaus playing in the background, but I cannot. So, ghost stories. <laughs> so, the first one is Alice of the Hermitage, near Morals Inlet, South Carolina. Can I? Yes. There are women capable of loving many men, and there are women who can only love one. Alice Balin Flagg belonged to the latter group, and as she would discover, it is those often people who suffer the most devastating heartbreaks. Among the wealthy classes in the antebellum South, there was no greater failing for women than to fall for a man from a lower class. Those who did suffered humiliation and heartbreak. Some, like Alice, even lost their lives. So ingrained is the story of Alice of Hermitage in South Carolina folklore that a novel, Alice Flagg, The Ghost of the Hermitage, by Nancy Rhine, has been written about her intense love affair and her short, tragic life. In 1849, Alice and her widowed mother lived under the rules of her ambitious brother, Dr. Allard Flagg, in Merle's Inlet at the Hermitage, a vine-draped mansion surrounded on three sides by tidal creeks. The extravagant home suited a powerful plantation owner and his family. Little was expected of Alice and others like her. As she blossomed from a child into a young woman, her bright personality and alluring good looks began to attract the attentions of many of the most eligible local bachelors. She enjoyed the enviable position of being courted by a string of handsome young men. Her brother went to sleep at night secure in the knowledge that his little sister would marry well and make the family proud. After all, Alice had an easygoing personality and wanted to please her brother. At the appropriate age, she was presented to society and quickly became a belle of the local scene. From the ages of six, 
14 to 16, Alice lived in a fairy tale world where her days were spent honing the skills that would one day be required in a rich plantation wife. She learned to play the piano, to dance, and to converse. She was often fitted with beautiful ball gowns for the numerous debutante balls she attended in the evenings. Unfortunately for Alice, the young man who eventually caught her eye was neither wealthy nor sophisticated. He was a handsome, hard-working laborer who was equally smitten by her. Alice's mother tried to talk Alice out of seeing the laborer. She knew the consequences would be dire, and her heart broke for the pain that Alice would have to face if she did not change her mind. But Alice refused to listen. She openly encouraged her suitor. He courted her according to the rules of the South, but nothing could change the fact that he came from a lower echelon of society. Dr. Allard disproved of their friendship from the beginning, but when it turned into a full-scale romance, he decided to put an end to it. He forbade Alice to see her young man, but she was a strong-willed young girl, and she continued to go out with him. Desperate to discourage their liaisons, Dr. Allard shadowed their every move. He refused to acknowledge the young man's presence and threatened to lock his little sister away in her room. It was all to no avail. Alice continued to secretly meet with her suitor. The courtship between the young lovers was brief, but powerful. They would allow nothing and no one to interfere with their love for each other. Their moments together were fleeting, but they did manage to meet occasionally. <sighs> That's so sad. And each meeting only served to strengthen the bond that was developing between them. In a final desperate attempt to sever their relationship completely, Dr. Allard shipped his sister off to a fashionable, very expensive boarding school in Charleston, South Carolina. Alice had no choice but to obey, but the distance served only to cement her feelings for the man that she loved. Before she was whisked away to the hermitage, Alice's bow placed an engagement ring on her finger. Alice made no attempt to hide the ring. She wore it openly and proudly, defying her brother's wishes. Her mother begged her to be more discreet, but she would not listen to reason. And when Dr. Allard discovered the ring, he flew into a rage. He insisted that she return it to her boyfriend. Alice agreed. She promised to do his bidding and slid the ring off her finger. In her heart, Alice hated her brother. She would take the ring off, but she swore to herself that it would never leave her person. When nobody was looking, she secretly looped it around her neck on a ribbon. For the duration of her school life, it lay next to her heart, hidden from prying eyes. Alice was not happy at boarding school. The other girls were kind to her, but she was not interested in new friendships and remained aloof. Although she excelled academically, she could not rid her heart or mind of the man she had sworn to, who had sworn to wait for her forever if necessary. As the weeks rolled into months, Alice became more and more homesick. She slumped around in a trance-like state, and her appetite dwindled as the once robust girl grew weak and frail. Eventually, illness invaded her weakened body. The school doctor was summoned. He examined Alice carefully and his official diagnosis was malaria. As he looked into his feverish patient's eyes, he intuitively sensed that this young girl was suffering from something much more than serious than a physical affliction. It seemed to him that she had no will to live. He wondered what terrible thing had happened to her to make her give up on her future. But he kept his thoughts to himself, instead advising the headmistress to send her home the risk to the other students was too great. By the time Dr. Allard arrived to take her home, Alice's fever had spiked. He bundled her into his carriage, shocked at the amount of weight she had lost. The journey home was long and the ride uncomfortable. He feared she might die en route. As the hot, humid nights and damp, blistering days passed, Alice's condition worsened. Dr. Allard prayed that his sister would survive the four-day journey. He worried about who would look after her when they got home. Hermitage House was empty in the spring, 
Their mother and most of the servants had retreated to the safety of the South Carolina foothills to escape malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Dr. Allard stayed behind to oversee the plantation. In spite of the terrible odds, Alice was still alive when they arrived at the hermitage. The sweet scent of gardenias hung heavily in the air as her brother carried her wasting body through the large veranda and up to her bedroom. As Alice slipped in and out of consciousness, she sought out the ring that hung around her neck, finally pulling it from beneath her nightgown. Dr. Allard was furious when he saw it. Nobody had ever dared to disobey him, yet his wife of a sister continued to do so. He grabbed the simple band of gold out of Alice's hand, deaf to her cries of protest. Then he strode across the room, flung open the nearest window, and tossed it into Hermitage Creek. What a dick. Alice became agitated and inconsolable. All through the night, she wept and pleaded with her brother to go out and find her ring. The next morning, she died, still crying for her ring. Dr. Allard had no way of reaching their mother. He felt alone and guilty, as he should. Unsure of what to do, he decided to bury her body on the grounds of the hermitage until he could hold a proper surface and internment. He dressed her in the same white gown that she had worn at her coming out ball, and later for viewing in a glass coffin. Her pale skin was hardly distinguishable from her virginal white dress. Ew, that wording. Neighbors and friends arrived from miles around to pay their last respects. When their mother returned, she ordered that her daughter's body be buried in the cemetery at All Saints Church near Polly's Island. It was assumed she would rest in peace beneath the giant oaks of South Carolina. As for her fiancé, he disappeared without a trace, never to be heard from again. Perhaps the agony of losing the love of his life so needlessly was more than he could bear. I like to think that they will be reunited on the other side, and that the love they were denied in life became theirs in death. All this happened over 150 years ago, but Alice's spirit, bereft of her fiancé and separated from the symbol of their love, did not find peace. Almost immediately after she was buried, a boy visiting the hermitage encountered a pale young woman on the staircase. I asked her name, he complained to his mother, but she refused to answer me. She seemed sad, but very beautiful. Okay. A shiver of apprehension settled on the adults gathered at the breakfast table. Tell us more about her? The boy's mothers asked. His description of a beautiful girl perfectly matched the description of Alice Beelan Flagg. That initial appearance was that of many. Over the years, the ghost of Alice became a common sight in and around All Saints Cemetery. Sometimes she sits placidly in the gardens of the hermitage. At other times, she is spotted staring out the window of her bedroom or tiptoeing up the grand staircase. Perhaps her saddest manifestations are when she appears in the graveyard, searching futilely for the ring that was her long ago lost lover gave to her so many generations ago. Alice's ghost appears in bare feet, with her white burial gown fluttering around her ankles as her thick, dark hair cascades down her back. She doesn't invoke fear in those who encounter her but rather sadness at the terrible loss she suffered for giving her heart to a man whom her brother could never endorse. Their vows were so powerful that even in death they would not be broken. Today visitors can go to the All Saints Cemetery and see Alice's final resting place. Her grave marker is simple, a flat slab of stone, a flat slab of stone with her name etched into the surface. Some might even meet the ghost of Alice face to face, still searching for her ring. Now, I've got to say, the fact that she's searching for her ring and the loss of it does lend credibility, but It's supposed to be romantic ghost stories, and that's just sad. 
like romantic would be if his ghost was also spotted still looking for her. The fact that it's just her and mostly her looking for her ring, it's to me evokes more so sadness than like Yeah. Like I'm going with romantic ghost stories. I mean obviously it's based about love. It's just me meh. The ghostly music of Harding College, CRC, Arkansas. Cirque? I'm going with Cirque. Her name is lost to human memory and her body is dust, but the music she played lives on in the halls of an Arkansas college, even though the girl has been dead for over 70 years. The music was the one thing that provided her with solace and comfort in her loneliest time. Harding College is 50 miles northeast of Little Rock. It is a respected co-ed Christian college that was once the stage for a terrible drama that ended in the death of two students. Mm. Mm -hmm -hmm. <clears throat> Psychic impression is the term paranormal investigators use to describe an entity that has lost its life force but continues to perform a repetitious act ad infinitum. I don't think I've ever heard them call it a psychic impression. Like, I don't know, I always kind of referred to those ones as more so just recordings. So, like, no one's there, but what's going on is just a loop. <clears throat> the young girl responsible for the haunting melodies, the haunting melodies that are still heard in Harding College was a music student in the 1930s. She fell passionately in love with another student, and he with her. If not for the intervention of fate, they might have spent their lives together. But late one night, a terrible car accident cut short the boy's life. The young girl became inconsolable and exiled herself to the third floor music room. She passed the lonely hours bent over her piano, lost in grief and finding some relief in the ivory keys beneath her fingers. Her friends and her teachers tried everything to break the spell of sadness imposed on her by the terrible accident. But they were helpless in the face of her despondence. She rarely left her piano, sinking instead into a bottomless pit of sorrow where nobody could reach her. She died only months after the death of her boyfriend. Everyone was saddened, but no one was surprised. Teachers and students alike attributed her passing to a broken heart. Clearly, the young woman couldn't face a future without the person she'd given her heart to. It was incomprehensible to her that she could ever love another man. She had passed on, but the emotion she had poured into her piano had left a psychic impression in the third floor music room. Soon after her death, Residents of Harding College began to hear hollow melodies drifting down from the ceiling from the music room. As time passed, college students and teachers became used to the plaintive, disembodied notes. Instead of being afraid, they felt empathy for their former colleague. Years later, the college underwent a large reconstruction. The third story, where the music room had once been, was utterly eliminated and a two-story structure was built in its place. Everyone thought the ghostly music would disappear in the wreckage of the renovation. They were wrong. To this day, the eerie notes of the long-dead pianist echo through the halls of Harding College. The music emanates from a non-existent third floor where the echoes of love reverberate from beyond the grave. Oh. See, that's a, that is so much more romantic. And a very dark and morbid way but to love someone so desperately so just like entwined with yourself 
that when they pass unexpectedly, you go into a melancholic music kick and then die and leave a recorded ghost? Yes. All right, so let's do a third one. We'll discuss down below which was our favorite, if we thought they were romantic, whatnot. If you think they sound like a bunch of boo-loney. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just really hard on ghost stories, but uh, like I need that ring of truth. And if you tell me it's romantic, it better be fucking romantic. The last one gave it to me more than the first, though. We'll see. So this is Till Death Do Us Join from Johns Island, South Carolina. Fenwick Hall on Johns Island is only 12 minutes and two bridges away from Charleston, South Carolina. Today, it is recognized of what is one of America's most remarkable 18th century plantations. Stockbroker John Purnell owns the mansion and its surrounding 55 acres, although it sat empty and derelict for years. Purnell has fully and lovingly restored the estate, and today it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Unfortunately, the 3,000 acres that once made up the sprawling plantation have long since fallen victim to time and recent development. As everything does. Of which, side note, you gotta love how they keep building more houses, and yet we still have a housing crisis. Because they built them for investment and not for people. Isn't that nice? Anyway. Recently, local historians opposed the construction of a high-density housing project, citing the plantation's rich history as a compelling reason for preservation. The ghosts of Fenwick Hall are probably on the side of the preservationists. After all, some of them have been there for over 200 years. Ooh, I like it. I like when ghosts interfere with construction. <laughs> I was like, get out of my house. Stop knocking down the walls. That's my job. So cute. Why do I picture all ghosts as crotchety old men? Huh. The seventh Earl of Fenwick, Lord Rapon, purchased the land on John's Island in the mid 1700s. An eccentric man, he commissioned the construction of a large mansion similar to his ancestral castle in England. Ancient silver maples and gnarly oaks conceal Fenwick Hall from the eyes of the curious. These same majestic trees graced Fenwick Hall long ago, when an army of servants and a battalion of slaves moved about the property under the watchful and sometimes cruel eyes of their masters. The celebrated Fenwick stables turned out some of South Carolina's best bloodlines, in fact, the horses received better care than the indentured workers could ever have imagined. I hope he dies. <clears throat> to be fair, he is dead. <laughs> but I hope he dies. <laughs> the Fenwicks were known for their extreme wealth, their fast horses, and their beautiful women. In those days of patriarchy still in those days. The only difference between good bloodlines and a horse and good bloodlines and a woman was that the horse was worth more money in the long run. The lord of the manor extended his kindness and generosity to those who obeyed his word and met his expectations. Those who didn't please him, regardless of whether they were human or animal, paid dearly he dies. The Earl's daughters were known what was expected of them, chastity, obedience, and exquisite manners. Their marriages were intended to improve the family line. Once they fulfilled their familial obligations, the young women were permitted to disappear into a life of banality and comfort. But the Earl's youngest daughter, 17-year-old Anne saw things differently. I like her. 
She flung off the constraints of her gender and social class and entertained herself exactly as she pleased. Anne was horse crazy. She spent all her free time in the stables, and perhaps it was inevitable that she should fall in love with Tony, the head groom, and he with her. Tony was handsome, <clears throat> bright, and he made Anne laugh, but most importantly, he had a wonderful way with horses. Out of a shared love for these noble beasts grew a respect for each other that blossomed into a romance. Neither had any intention of conducting their relationship behind Lord Ripon's back. Still, it must have taken an enormous amount of courage for the teenaged Anne to approach her tyrannical father and ask for permission to marry Tony. She did it with all the optimism of a young girl in love. Really? All of her descriptions about this house, and that's what it looks like? Meh. Not surprisingly, her father vehemently refused, but Anne naively believed that she could bend his iron will. Her tenacity compelled her to ask her father again and again for his blessing. She refused to hide her love for Tony and could see no reason for her father's objections. After all, she argued, Tony had a good job, he already lived on the estate, and they both shared a passion for the thoroughbreds that had made the Fenwick name a legend in the racing world. Anne underestimated her father's snobbery and overestimated his love for her. Since she had been a little girl, she received everything she wanted, but this time it was different. It took her a long time but she finally realized that her father would see her a die, die of a broken heart than marry a man who was below her station in life, even if that was the only man she could ever love. Anne did not easily abandon her dreams. There was one thing she wanted in life, and that was to be with Tony. Now she had to figure out how to do it. Tony loved her madly, but sometimes when he was alone, he questioned whether they could ever be together. Lord Fenwick was not an easy man to cross, and Tony was secretly afraid of him, but Anne wasn't. After much thought, she came to the conclusion that she had only two options, obey her father and live in mis misery, or flee the only life she had ever known. To her, there was no choice. Anne convinced Tony to elope with her. Eventually, Daddy will forgive us. You'll see. Late one night, she crept out of her bedroom, carrying only a small bag of necessary clothes. She moved furtively through the thick, thickly carpeted, elegant halls of the castle. Castle. And beyond the pillars into the humid night, she ran across the magnificent gardens to the stables where Tony awaited her arrival. He had already tacked up the fastest horse in the stable when Anne fell into his arms. Finally, they would begin their lives together. We haven't got a second to lose. I could be discovered missing at any time. She climbed up on the horse behind Tony, and without a glance backward, they headed for the marsh. There they hoped to find a boat to the mainland, but none was to be had. They searched until they were exhausted. Finally, they realized they would have to wait until daylight. It was too late to turn back. A ramshackle hut on the river's edge seemed the perfect place to stay until morning, and so Tony and Anne spent their first night together in each other's arms. It was everything they hoped for and more. Anne knew in her heart that she had made the right decision. She knew she could not live without Tony. How the fuck do they know? Uh, like I get it's a romantic ghost story, but also how do they know what lived up to their expectations uh that is some artful conjecture before dawn lord rapon discovered that his daughter had run away he immediately formed a search party to look for her enraged he vowed to avenge his family name and punish her with his wayward daughter but he was not prepared to find her in the arms of her lover when he burst into the riverside shed Ooh. 
Out of his mind with anger, he literally dragged them back to the plantation. No one disobeyed the Earl of Fenwick, certainly not his daughter. Anne, terrified but still defiant, was imprisoned in her bedroom. Tony's punishment was much more severe. Lord Rapal was furious that his head groom had betrayed him, so he sentenced Tony to death by lynching. Tony was quickly bound, blindfolded, and placed in the saddle, with a noose around his neck and the end of the rope secured to a silver maple. Still, Lord Rapal was not satisfied. In an unparalleled act of cruelty, he forced Anne out to the garden. She screamed and cried and begged for him to show mercy, but he was beyond reason. Instead, he placed a horse whip in her hand. Anne refused to lash the horse beneath Tony, so her father took her hand and did it with her. The horse leapt forward. Tony's neck snapped like a twig. As Anne watched his life choke out of him, she crumpled to the ground, her lover's name on her lips. Tony, she called. Tony. But Tony had been silenced forever. Tony, she cried again, and fell into a dead faint. From that terrible day on, she never uttered any other word but his name until the day she died. The trauma of seeing her lover die by her own hand caused something to snap in Anne Fenwick. She never regained her sanity, and death came and took her away soon after. Since that terrible time, bad luck has plagued the Fenwick plantation. Good. Lord Rapon's descendants lost the property to the Confederate Army during the Civil War and were forced to leave South Carolina. But he didn't die! Today, the spirits of the lovers continue to haunt Benwick. They are not alone, however. Other spirits have been seen, including a headless horseman. But it is the ghosts of Anne and Tony that are most often heard or seen. Sometimes Anne's spirit is spotted alone. It drifts about the property, calling out Tony's name in a plaintive voice. And sometimes Tony's spirit joins her, and then the two lovers walk silently beneath the silver maples, together in death in a way that they never could be in life. Mm. Uh, that is <sighs> fucked history is fucked but I have to say the ghost part the fact that they sometimes get to walk together beneath the trees pretty romantic and as I say true love never dies even though I joke about till death and love you to death and death love but True love never dies. So, I like it that they get to be together in the afterlife, not not what happened. <laughs> that is for a gaff dang sure. But, oh boy, the next one is the ghost of Tom Ellis. What happened? <laughs> well, I mean, I am interested... Let me know if you are as well, if you are also intrigued. And would like to hear more. Well, on that note, lovelies, before I lose my voice, and I am more hoarse than the horses in the stable, I'm going to wrap this up here. Let me know which was your favorite. If you disagree with me on the, the levels of romance. You're allowed, but you have to have a good reason. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay sane, stay spooky, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. <laughs>